Brady. So, uh, today we heard of our action packed demise. Um, so, before starting, I wanted to um, clarify something from yesterday. So, maybe my pronunciation is not so good. But since Boris asked me about this, the, what I mentioned is that we observed these reflections off of uh, meteors, and I guess the notion is meteorite. So the idea is that we have our receiver antenna out here, and so here's the transmitter antenna. And here's the receiver antenna on the other way. And so here's the transmitter antenna that I drew in Utah. And the receiver is over here. And in fact, there's no direct line of sight between transmitter and receiver. So the only way you can see these reflections, these meteorite aprochenia, is because of the fact that these meteorites, when you see a meteorite up in the air, the interaction is happening typically at a elevation of about 70 kilometers or so above the surface of the Earth. So the fact that we see these reflections means that it cannot be due to the direct signal because, again, there's no line of sight, there's no direct path between the transmitter and the receiver. We only see this signal by virtue of the reflection. And since, of course, the Earth is curved, the so-called horizon from this height is about uh, 1,000 kilometers away. And this total distance is 1,600 kilometers. So that's the geometry of the detection scheme. All right, so today I'm going to just spend the rest of our time talking about some of the experiments that we do in uh, in Antarctica, and most of these, again, are neutrino detection experiments. And um, here are some of the reasons why you do neutrino physics, and I don't have to tell you any of this. The main reason is that, um, first of all, there's no GZK cutoff for neutrinos, so in principle, you can probe the entire universe unlike high energy protons that are limited to six megaparsecs because of the GZK effect. And the second thing is that because of the fact that um, neutrinos are uncharged, there's no magnetic deflection. Remember that for an experiment like the Pierre Audet experiment, which is looking up into the sky, Objects with an energy less than 10 to the 18th electron volts are going to deflect by something like 5 to 10 degrees. So, if you're sitting here on the Earth and there's a charged particle which is created with an energy of, say, something like 10 to 17 electron volts, and it's produced from a distance of 10 megaparsecs, away from the Earth, then because the intergalactic magnetic field is non-zero, typically this particle will be you know, deflected and scrambled, and you see it coming from a direction which does not correspond to the actual source direction. It's only when the energy gets up to about 10 to the 19th electron volts or so that, the, that you can trace the object back to its source. Neutrinos, of course, don't have that problem. They're immune to magnetic deflections. Okay, this is all familiar to you. 
Um, so, some common facts about neutrinos. Uh, there's, as we spoke about, 330 Big Bang neutrinos from, um, from the Big Bang. They have an energy of about a millivolt. Uh, solar neutrinos, the, the canonical number is that there are 60 billion solar neutrinos that pass through your sun, pass through your thumb uh, every second. And it's remarkable that they manage to avoid the rest of your body. So of course, they go through the rest of your body as well. And um, on average, so there's all these neutrinos from the sun that are going through your body all the time. And on average, depending on how long you live, about one of these will actually be stopped by the material in your body. So it's important that you be awake for that event. Hopefully you don't sleep through that. Um, and of course, since we uh, have dissolved um, uh, potassium-40, each person is emitting something like 200 million neutrinos because of the decay of radioactive um, potassium. Uh, high energy neutrinos is the classification that will give to neutrinos above uh, 10 to the 15th electron volts or 1 PeV. And these are dominantly produced by um, supernovas. So these are supernovas integrated over the entire history of the universe. And then there are the ultra high energy neutrinos. These are say the GZK neutrinos, and these have the canonical flux of one per square kilometer per year. Um, yeah. Okay, so given the fact that uh, neutrinos interact so rarely, you can think about different possible targets. Uh, the possible targets that you'll use have to be big. So you can use, um, you can think about moon rock. So you can think about an experiment, and I'll talk about an experiment that we're involved with, where neutrinos interact with the so-called lunar regolith, which is the outer portion, the outer limb of the moon, and that results in radio waves that are directed at the Earth. And this was what was originally um, suggested by Ascarian in 1962. Um, the ice sheet um, oil deposits are big. But neither oil deposits nor seawater have satisfied the requirement that the radio wave attenuation length must be long. The radio wave attenu attenuation length in both of these media is very short. Um, and as I talked about before, you might think about doing this experiment in a large deposit of salt, which in the US is called a salt dome. And um, the problem with that is that it's not free. Okay, and here's the picture that I drew of the, um, of the mechanism that's responsible for this long wavelength uh, coherence, as it's called. So again, we're looking at the coherent long wavelength signal where one wavelength is bigger than the transverse scale of the shower compared to the short wavelength signal. Now there's one caveat about this. And that has to do with something. So here's a shower. So you can think about this as, an, for instance, an electromagnetic shower or a hadronic shower. But there is a caveat with this, and that's because of what's called the LPM effect. How many of you are familiar with the LPM effect? Landau, Pomeranchuk, Migdal. So see what it is the cone. LPM effect. We can use night typically. Okay. The LPM effect is an effect which, not surprisingly, was um, first described by um, Landau and later elaborated on by Migdal. And the basic idea runs as follows. Imagine, so let's imagine that we have an electron neutrino. And this electron neutrino interacts with the nucleus. And as a result, we get a charge current interaction, and an electron comes out and initiates a cascade. Now, so here's my electron coming out. And the electron, of course, in the Heitler model, as we talked about yesterday, 
the first thing that happens in the shower development is that there is Bremsstrom. E minus goes to E minus gamma. So there's some target nucleus here, a little atom. And so this, for instance, could be an oxygen nucleus or a hydrogen nucleus in the ice. And the, what we can do is we can ask what happens to the cross-section. So how does the cross-section depend on the energy of the incident um, or the energy of this electron? Well, what we'll do is that we'll, we'll say that the incident electron has an initial momentum P sub i. It scatters off of the um, it scatters off of the nucleus. There's a momentum transfer Q. So Q is the standard momentum transfer. And we'll say K is the momentum of the photon emitted in this Bremsstrahlung interaction. So again, all we're doing is we're, we're saying here's the electron that comes in, it emerges with some final momentum P sub F, there is a photon which is emitted which has a uh, momentum K gamma and Q is the momentum transfer, if you like, it's momentum transfer to the recoil nucleus. So this is stuff that you've probably all seen before, it's fairly straightforward. And what you can show is that the, uh, the momentum transfer, uh, the momentum transfer Q goes as something like K over gamma squared. So as, as, the, as the shower develops, yeah, so as the shower develops, so Q, of course, is just equal to P sub i minus, this is the total momentum of the electron plus the photon. And as the energy, so gamma is just the standard Lorentz factor gamma. So as the energy of the electron gets larger and larger, gamma also gets larger and larger, which means that Q gets smaller and smaller. Well, this is not very surprising. In you know, in standard, you know, for standard physics introductions, you talk about billiard ball physics. And I don't know, how, how do you say it in, in Russian? Billiard ball interactions. The billiard. Okay. So, if I think about if I think about this in terms of billiard ball interactions, the higher the incident uh, particle, the smaller the fractional momentum transfer to the target. Now, the problem is, is that what this means is that as gamma gets very, very big, Q gets very, very small. So the momentum transfer gets very, very small, and the entire scale of both momentum transfer as well as the emitted photon energy also go down. Now, because of that, there is a relationship between the momentum scale of the transfer momentum and what's called the formation zone, which is, if you like, the interaction length. So, if the electron is very slow, the interaction length is basically the diameter of one atom. But, if Q becomes, if gamma gets very high, Q gets very low, and now I can write a relationship which is something like Q times L formation is greater than or equal to H bar. So L formation is the transverse region over which the interaction happens. Okay, so again, gamma goes up, Q goes down, Q goes down, L formation by the uncertainty principle has to get very, very large. 
So it's no longer the case that this electron is just interacting with a single nucleus. Another heuristic way of describing it is that the electron is moving so fast that the target is going to be, um, the, the, the target basically shrinks, Lorentz contracts towards the electron so that now the electron just sees a uniformly charged mass, neutral mass, uh, because the negative charges of the electron have essentially merged with the positive charges of the nuclear charge. Okay, the upshot is that Q goes down, L formation goes up, the formation length goes up, now the electron in one over one formation length sees not only this nucleus, but it sees the nucleus behind it. And now, the total interaction probability, I have to sum over the probability of interaction with this atom plus this atom, plus the next atom, and I'm going to get destructive interference. So when I calculate the rate, I sum up the graphs for everything within one formation length, and I start to see cancellation of terms, and consequently, the electron, the total cross-section goes down. So, schematically, what that means is that this shower, this electromagnetic shower, now gets extended by a huge amount. So instead of having this nice concentration of charge that we had before, this is specifically for an electron, this whole thing gets stretched out, and now I no longer have this huge coherent radio signal. So most of the signal that we see does not come from electromagnetic showers. Most of it comes from hadronic showers. In hadronic showers, I'll get pions, and in fact the pions will produce, in some cases, photons. Photons will feel the LPM effect, but the typical energy of the photons is low enough that it's below this LPM threshold. So the net signal that we see mostly comes from photon contributions. Okay, and this is a tabulation of the, um, the stretching of the shower. So in ice, for instance, the total stretching of an electromagnetic shower with the LPM effect compared to an LP, a shower without the LPM effect is a factor of 20. Instead of having a shower with a radiation length of 40 centimeters, now the radiation length has stretched to 8 meters. And again, I no longer have this coherent addition of all of the, all of the radio wave vectors. Okay. Um, all right, so the neutrino fluxes at Earth. What is there out there to be detected? Well, there are um, what's called conventional uh, muon neutrino, conventional electron neutrino. These are just muons and electron neutrinos that are coming from extensive air showers, um, which generate pion and can decays. There's a contribution that comes from charm meson decays. Every so often, in an air shower, I can have a D meson produced. Very rarely, but sometimes. And then the D meson will decay semi-leptonic. D goes to K E nu, for instance, or K star nu, or K mu nu, K star mu nu. And again, that will give me uh, so-called prompt muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos, as opposed to these atmospheric neutrinos, which are the result of um, a pion decay in an in air shower. Okay, in addition to that, there are the so-called astrophysical sources, uh, such as, and of course we don't know what these are, a priori, but we can model them. This is somebody's model of an active galactic nucleus. And then there are the cosmogenic neutrinos that we talked about yesterday that, can, that come from interactions of ultra-high energy protons with the cosmo-microwave background. Now, there's a very famous bound, so the question is, how how large can the flux of neutrinos be 
at the earth, what is allowed. And then there's this, there's this very famous bound, which is called the wax or the call limit. And the way it works is the following. The first thing that you need is some source. So you start up with a source, for instance, like a GRD or some active galactic nucleus, some black hole. And you don't know anything about this source except that this source has a magnetic field and there are magnetic shocks which are confining protons. So this source produces protons and there are shocks which are accelerating the protons and very importantly the magnitude of the magnetic field must be large enough that you can generate proton energies through shock acceleration of up to, say, 10 to the 19th, 10 to the 20th electron volts. So you have some source which is capable of generating very high, has high magnetic fields and high magnetic shocks. Now, to get an energy this high, you have to have, in fact, a very high magnitude magnetic field. So high that the magnetic field is likely to confine the protons. So if you can find the protons, how do you get neutrinos and even ultra-high-energy cosmic rays coming out of this? Well, some of the protons will leak out. But the way that you get neutrinos through this waxman bacall mechanism in this model is that these protons will interact with photons in and around the source. That interaction is exactly identical to the cosmogenic neutrino mechanism. So you get P gamma, and that produces neutrons. Neutrons escape confinement. Most of the protons in this model are actually contained within this huge magnetic field. Neutrons escape, they decay into protons, electrons, and neutrinos. And you can deter, and that gives you a limit on the, so that, that's a mechanism for producing, uh, for instance, neutrinos. How many neutrinos can you have? Well, you make a stipulation. You see that the total energy in neutrinos must be less than the total energy observed in ultra high energy cosmic rays. That is to say, whatever the Pierre Auger experiment measures for the total energy in ultra high energy cosmic rays, the total energy in neutrinos has to be less than that. That's a pretty reasonable assumption. And that's what gives you this so called wax and bacall bound. Although there's, there's various knobs that you can tune in this, in this model. But it's a very reasonable bound. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that that bound is likely going to be excluded soon. Okay, so that's what you'd expect. And in fact, this is what the, the, actual, um, the actual data looked like. Uh, so the muon neutrino spectra and the electron neutrino spectra as measured by the ice cube experiment uh, looks pretty similar to expectations. Well, the expectations are pretty solid. They're pretty easy to determine because of the fact that we have measurements of extensive air showers at the Earth. So, being able to predict what these are is, is pretty straightforward. Okay, of course, what we measure at Earth... So, let's suppose that from this wax from a call mechanism, all we get are electron neutrinos. Well, we know now, of course, that neutrinos mix, and probably uh, there'll be complete mixing. So this is, for instance, a model where, uh, where the neutrinos are coming from pion decay. Such a model will give you two muon neutrinos for every one electron neutrino. But whatever your model is, typically, you end up with a fully flipped, fully mixed, um, admixture of electron, muon, and neutrinos at the Earth. And that's what we expect in our models. 
Okay, now, in order to determine your expected detection rates, of course, you have to figure out some interaction links. The, the neutron the neutrino has to interact in the material of your target. For instance, the ice or the water. And to do that, you have to fold in the neutrino cross-section. The neutrino cross-section, as you know, increases with energy. And the sort of heuristic explanation for this is that if you take a neutrino and the neutrino sees some nucleon, then as the neutrino, as the neutrino energy gets larger and larger, it starts to see more and more of the um, more and more of the C quarks in the neutron, in, in the nucleon. I don't know if these are called in Russian. It's the same, it's not Moria. Collective of Moria, okay. So as the neutrino energy gets larger and larger, the, it appears that there are more targets to interact with. There are more and more C quarks, and consequently, the cross section increases. And then there's this resonance at this point, which corresponds to the case where um, you get new plus, essentially, nucleon, giving you W. So you resonantly produce uh, W. So there's some quark, it's actually the nucleus of Q, the quark inside the nucleon. And there's some neutrino energy for which you can resonantly produce Ws, and that gives you a big enhancement in the cross-section, which is called the Glashow, Glashow resonance. And here are some pictures of the possible um, of, of, here are your pictures which represent those typical uh, neutrino energies. So here are terrestrial neutrinos that are coming, for instance, from the decay of radioactive material in the Earth's crust. This again is what's responsible for producing heat in the Earth's crust. Uh, and of course the Big Bang neutrinos are down here at the, the very end. Okay, now because the cross-section is rising with energy, that means that in fact if you get, it gets high enough energies, the Earth is no longer transparent to neutrinos. The Earth is transparent to neutrinos coming from, for instance, the Sun, or atmospheric neutrinos. However, at our energies, 10 to the 16th and 10 to the 17th and 10 to the 18th electron volts, the Earth is, in fact, opaque to neutrinos. So at, let's see, 10 to the, so here is 10 to the 13.5 uh, electron volts. So this would be something like um, um, several hundred TeV. And at that point, the Earth becomes opaque to neutrinos. Neutrinos will interact with the, will interact through one full diameter of Earth maps. Okay, so those are, the, those are the basics of neutrinos. Now, how do we detect them? As I said before, there are some obvious possible targets that we can use. One target that we can think about using is the moon. And we've done that, so here is, uh, I saw this on one of your TV stations. Um, so, the, uh, so the way to do this is you imagine that this is the moon and you're sitting here watching the moon and what you're looking for are neutrinos that are interacting with the very outer crust of the moon. So there's a very small region here which is about 10 meters thick. And if the neutrino interacts within that 10 meter radius of stuff on the edge of the moon, then it will produce a shower, and that shower will produce radio waves through the mechanism that I, that I outlined. Now, why is it only 10 meters? It's only 10 meters because that's the attenuation length of radio waves in lunar rock. In the ice, the attenuation length is something like two kilometers. But in lunar rock, it's much smaller, it's only about 10 meters. So this is what an antenna 
looks like, which could be sitting on the ground and looking for radio wave signals coming from an interaction in the moon. And in fact, there's an array, there's an array of such, um, such antennas in New Mexico. Uh, you may recognize this picture. This is the very long baseline array, which was the, um, the site of the movie uh, where our great American actress Jodie Foster makes contact. Have you seen this? Yes, you said. Of course you have. Um, so, this is called the VLBA, the Very Large Baseline Array, and uh, in fact, um, has anybody ever been out there? No. It's pretty obscure. Uh, well, I had to go out there, and it's pretty interesting. You see that there are these rails, there's actually these, these um, there are these train rails, and these things can move along these train rails a distance of about 20 kilometers in each direction. And that's how they get the large baseline. This is our array. So this is an array. So each one of these antennas is identical to the one that we, this one, that we built in our, in our little lab um, in the University of Kansas at KU. And um, the way it works, of course, is that this array of antennas is constantly taking data. And the array itself is, um, is pointed in a particular direction. So it does this thing called beam forming. And the way that works is that each one of the, if you imagine a plane wave, so let's take, let's take two different, two adjacent receivers. Here's a receiver and here's a receiver. Or say here and here and here. And there's a signal which is coming in from the moon. Then if I have receiver one here and receiver two here, then I have incoming plane waves. Oops. I have incoming plane waves, and the arrival time difference between the signal arriving at this receiver and the signal arriving at this receiver is just equal to some C T, where T is the measured time delay between the signal receiver received here versus there. And that means that this CT, of course, corresponds to some angle theta. The bigger if CT is equal to zero, then plane waves are directly incident from just above the receiver. So the way this array works is that phone somebody and say, I want to look at a source which is at some angle theta relative to the array. And what they'll do is they digitally program in a delay between this receiver and that receiver. So they'll program in a delay equal to CT between the electronics, the, arrive, the signal arrival time for this receiver versus that receiver, and then 2CT for that receiver versus that receiver. And in that way, you essentially can point, quote unquote, you steer the beam into the sky. So of course, the array on its own is sensitive to the entire sky. But by cleverly programming in the correct delays, you can maximize the, um, the sensitivity to a particular direction in the sky. And again, that's called beam steering. So we call them up. And we say, we'd like to take measurements. We'd like to steer the beam towards the moon and look for neutrinos interacting with the moon, producing radio waves. And we'll go ahead and they do it. Um, as I mentioned before, we have done, or there's a project. Yeah, so there's a project called the Pride Experiment, which we're about to apply for money for, which I'd be very surprised if we got it. 
And the prime experiment is, again, it's a, uh, it's an orbital, it's an orbiter that would go up somewhere around 2023, and it would circle around uh, the icy moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and again, what it's looking for are neutrinos interacting in the ice producing radio waves, and so there, <laughs> yeah, so of course, um, of course, this diagram is wrong, I just realized, because this ray should refract at that surface, but um, hopefully whoever is re reviewing this proposal will not take off points for that. Anyway, that, that's the idea. Okay, and then, of course, most of what we do is neutrino detection in Antarctica, um, and here is the... Here's the famous placard, which is a monument to Roll Amundsen and Robert Scott that I talked about before. Oh, as a sidelight, um, in, um, so on December 4th, Roll Amundsen came to the South Pole on December 14th, 1911. And to commemorate it, the uh, Prime Minister of Norway uh, came to the South Pole. Um, in 2011 to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of Roel Amundsen um, discovering the South Pole. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Prime Minister of Norway, not personally, but he has these famous YouTube videos where he basically just gets into a cab in Oslo and he basically just talks to people. I can easily imagine Vladimir Putin or Barack Obama doing that. And um, and he was a uh, he was a very sort of funny guy. So instead of just you know, I guess being a Norwegian, instead of just coming to the South Pole, he felt that it was his obligation, in honor of the tradition of Roald Amundsen, to um, to camp out. Uh, so he set up a camp that was about 20 kilometers away from the South Pole, and then he skied into uh, the South Pole and made. Um, Made a little, he gave a little speech, which was also um, kind of funny because he had spoken to a lot of the people who were doing science, the South Pole, and um, in his speech, as he's commemorating 100 years of the South Pole and commemorating Roald Amundsen's arrival there, um, what he said was something to the effect of, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here at the South Pole, it was very nice to talk with a lot of people. I understand there's a lot of science being done, and a lot of you, a lot of the scientists are studying phenomena from 13 billion years ago. And here's, he's referring to the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then he said, um, you know, 13 billion years is difficult for me to imagine. In fact, I can't even remember the promises that I made to the Norwegian voters two years ago when they elected me. He was a funny guy. All right, so here's, here's Antarctica. This is what it looks like in January. This is how you get in. Of course, you're taken in by the American military. They do everything. Um, and this is what the planes look like. They have, uh, they just land on skis. Um, this is the South Pole uh, Telescope. Um, you see everything here. This is, um, this is the so-called Martin A. Pomerantz Observatory. And this is the, um, this building is also a, as you can see from these horns, this is also a CMB experiment. So this is in fact where the bicep measurements were made. There's another lab which is over here, which is not shown here in this picture, which is called the Ice Cube uh, Laboratory, which is where most of the, um, most of the hardware for the Ice Cube experiment is located. And then over here about, let's see, so the main South Pole Station is about a kilometer in your direction. And then another kilometer in that direction is a place where they do studies of um, atmospheric, um, well basically the people that tell you that the ozone hole is getting bigger or smaller are down there about a kilometer. Okay, and this is what the, um, this is what the CMB uh, measurement uh, facility looks like in, for instance, January. This South Pole telescope can rotate, it has this heavy counterweight, 
and it can rotate both in theta, in theta and in phi. Every year, um, they have to dig out the... So, remember that there's snow, which is basically just blowing the entire winter. And so, between, you know, April and October, snow is just blowing wind across the continent. And that snow is just going to keep blowing until it hits something solid. So it'll blow for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, and then all of a sudden, here's a building, and it stops. So if there's anything on the Antarctic Plateau, it will start to very rapidly accumulate a lot of snow. So every year, they have to take these bulldozers, and they have to excavate about 10 meters worth of snow. The way that they, so very cleverly, um, they built a new main station, main base at the South Pole, and the way that they got around this problem was they put the whole thing up on pylons. I don't know how to say pylon in Russian, it means the same word. So they put the whole thing up on stilts, so the snow just blows underneath it. There's some accumulation underneath it, but the pylons can raise up into the air. So the whole station, the entire station, which is, I'm not doing that in my head, this probably has a baseline of maybe, um, I would say, maybe, maybe 50 meters by, maybe, maybe 5,000 square meters. And this whole station, is on these pylons, and each year they raise the pylons up just a little bit more. And they'll be able to do that for another 40 years or so, and then they'll run the space. Um, but anyway, so they have to bulldoze the whole thing each year. Uh, and this is what it looked like um, three weeks ago. So the sun is nominally below, below the horizon, so there's no direct sunlight here. This is all just residual sunlight that's coming from uh, over the horizon. And one of the most important things that they have to do is they have to put up these flags because there are people that have to keep the experiments running. The main base is over here. And if the, you know, suddenly there's some electrical problem here at two o'clock in the morning, they have to get up, they have to crawl, they have to somehow go from the main base, which is a kilometer away out here, and sometimes, you know, the winds are blowing at 40 meters a second or so, it's minus 90 degrees centigrade. So what they do is they string up this little, there's, you can't see it, but there's a little rope that goes along this path so that if you, if you, if you have a total, it's called in English whiteout, I don't know what it's called in Russian, a total whiteout and you can't see anything, you just guide yourself in the darkness with this little rope. So, by now, of course, the sun is all the way down, and this is what you can expect to see. So this is a bad picture, but this is, of course, the, uh, the aurora in the background. It's pretty spectacular. And there's also, I'll mention, there's also an underground tunnel system which links the main base to the, um, to the main generators. So one of the big, you know, what are the possible disaster scenarios at the South Pole? Biggest disaster scenario is that something happens with the power generator and there's a whiteout and you can't fix it or somehow you can't get to the generator. So this tunnel system connects the main base to the generator. The station runs with a power budget of about um, a megawatt or so. Yes, one or two megawatts. It's pretty big. All right. And so, of course, I talked a little bit about why Antarctica is a good place to do cosmic ray astronomy. The ice is clear. The attenuation length in the optical regime is about 100 meters, which is remarkable. You can take, you know, you can take a... Um, a soccer for what you call the football field here, worth of ice, and you can put somebody at the other end 
of that football field, and you can actually see an image through 100 meters. It's pretty remarkable. For radio wave, radio wave uh, signals, the attenuation wave, as we talked about before, is about 1.5 uh, kilometers. Um, and then, of course, ice provides a stable, pre-made laboratory. It's not only a good target, but you can put stuff in it, and it stays there. It's stable. Now, the hard thing is, how do you get stuff into the ice? And for that, um, they've devised this very elaborate system of drilling holes into the ice. And the way that, so there are two ways that you can drill holes. One is with a little mechanical borer, and there you basically just have a little spiral thing that drives into the ice and extracts a core. That was what was used at Vostok. And as you probably know, the Vostok core goes down to about, um, I think it's about 3,400 meters. It took them two years to drill that core. Why did it take two years to drill a hole into the, and the hole is about that big across. Why did it take them two years? It took them two years because the drill goes fairly slowly into the ice, then you drill out a piece this big, and then it comes back. So most of the time, you know, it takes 20 minutes for the drill head to get down to the bottom and then drill out some ice, and then another 20 minutes for it to come back. So most of the time in that two-year period that it took to drill 3,400 meters into the ice at Vostok was spent waiting for the drill head to get from the surface down to below and then back again. The strategy that they've used here is different. Here what you do is you transport all of this hardware from the northern hemisphere down to Antarctica. And all this hardware consists of is a big heater, which is heating up water to a temperature of about 90 C, and is, um, and keeps the, let's see, the pressure isn't listed here, but you basically have a very high temperature and high pressure nozzle, which is slowly drilling and melting the ice as it goes down. The amount of water which is being circulated through this plan is about uh, 12,000 cubic centimeters um, per second. The power consumption maximum is running at several megawatts. It's huge. And the speed that this hole is being drilled at is about two centimeters per second. So the hole is being drilled actually fairly rapidly. There was a, so if you, if you start from, uh, start from zero, so if you start with, here's your hose, here's your nozzle, and over the course of about 36 hours, you drill out, well you don't actually drill it out because you're not actually pulling the water out, you melt a hole down to about 2,400 meters. And this hole has a diameter, as you can see, sort of made down. The diameter of this hole is about 60 centimeters. So it's big enough to, you know, fall into. The other thing about this hole is that since you're melting this ice, and since ice is denser than water, that means that when when you've totally melted this column of ice, the top of the water is about 150 meters from the upper surface because of the fact that the ice has, I mean, this water has a higher density, so the upper part is empty. And then, once you've done that, then you drop your hardware into this hole and then you let it freeze. And there's a standard question, which is how long would you suspect? Now this ice, remember, up here is say at about 55, minus 55 C. How long would you expect this uh, hole to refreeze? 
when sitting in this infinite reservoir of cold ice, again, it's about 60 centimeters in diameter. And if I were to ask myself, how long would I expect this water to refreeze, I would guess on the order of hours or something. It turns out it's about two weeks. And um, it's actually more like 20 days. And the reason for that is something that you know, namely that ice, in fact, is a very good insulator. So even though there's this infinite reservoir here, the heat capacity of this reservoir is, in fact, very, very high. The way that it refreezes is actually pretty interesting. What happens is that it refreezes from the sides, and it also forms a little crust up top. I say crust, ice crust. Kanishka? What is it called? Korka. Okay, like, like on a bottle. Yeah. Okay, so it forms a little korka up top. So as it freezes in from the sides, as it freezes in from the sides, of course, the pressure increases, and eventually the pressure gets large enough that the korka gets blown off, and the pressure is relieved, and the ice forms a new equilibrium level. And then you get another little korka up here. And then the whole thing repeats, and it just keeps happening uh, over and over again until after about uh, two and a half weeks, finally, the ice comes back, the water refreezes back to its, its original level. Well, it's, I mean, again, it's, it's, an enormous, it's an enormous enterprise, and it consumes an awful amount of gasoline and, um, and fuel each. Um, so it's like, what is it, how many, 30, 35 rubles per liter of gasoline here, which is still a mystery to me. That's 35 rubles, let me do the math in my head. Um, that's like two and a half dollars per, what we say, gallon, for four liters in Russia. That's about the same thing in America. Every gallon of gas that's consumed for this enterprise, it costs about $20. And that $20 is mostly the overhead in transporting all of that gasoline from here <laughs> to Antarctica. Well, we get some from America, too. But, uh, so there, there's very high overhead in, uh, in transportation costs. Anyway, so this is what they used to drill 86 holes down to a depth of uh, 2,400 meters. And it's a, like I said before, it's a remarkable, um, a remarkable engineering achievement. And all this is just for reheating the water. This is the scaffolding, so the hole is actually inside here. This is just a guide, and then you drill the hole inside that scaffolding. Okay, this is another picture of the whole setup. So the maximum pressure in this whole system is 7 megapascals. Uh, 4.8 megawatt heating plant. And the drilling, I should, well, I won't talk about this, but the drilling actually goes in, in two phases, but again, I'll, I won't talk about that. All right, so this is what hole drilling looks like. Here is a, here's one of the PMTs. Um, and this is a side view. Oh, you saw better pictures before. This is this is what so this is what a radio. So there's a radio antenna inside here, um, and it's about to be lowered into the drill hole. And this gives you a side, the scale of the horizontal diameter of the hole, and there it is going in. Okay, and this is not a real picture. Because obviously, even from a depth of 2,400 meters, there's no way that you could actually see sunlight from above. But this is an artist's conception, which lots of people are are fond of showing. They even, you know, even mess up the picture a little bit to give the impression of reality. So, if you imagine that, you know, this is your your that you're sitting inside the um, 
the array down at a depth of about two kilometers. This is what you might see as you're looking up. Okay, so that's, so before talking about the results, which I'm not going to get to anyway, the last thing that I'll do is I'll at least just describe how the, um, how the second big project that we work with called the Anita Experiment works. And here, what you're doing is you're not, the radio receivers that you're using are not in the ice, but the radio receivers are hanging from a balloon. You're up at a height of 37 kilometers, and from a height of 37 kilometers, the horizon is about 700 kilometers away. So you can see a disk, which has a radius of 700 kilometers from this vantage point. And in principle, you're sensitive to neutrinos that interact anywhere within that 700 kilometer radius disk. So you have an enormous uh, geometric acceptance. So the observed area is 1.5 million square kilometers. So I think this is right. All right, now one of the, just, just to uh, be explicit, this balloon is up around 38 kilometers and at a height of 38 kilometers, the pressure is about five, uh, five millibars. So you're down around about 0.5% of uh, earth pressure, which presents some challenges in, uh, in doing the experiment. The other thing is that the, um, the, uh, the air temperature goes through this odd inversion, and by the time you get up to 38 kilometers, it's actually still pretty, uh, it's pretty warm because you have, you have a direct line to the sun. So your electronics can get very, very warm. So your entire, all your electronics, everything has to be painted white in order to uh, minimize the, um, the thermal load. Okay, so this is, so there were four flights that, uh, that occurred uh, just a few months ago. Uh, this is in uh, December, January. Uh, the Anita 3 project was the third incarnation of this main experiment, Anita. Uh, these, all these experiments start off from McMurdo, and as I said before, you get this odd wind pattern in Antarctica in uh, December or so, where the winds just circulate around the South Pole at an elevation of about 38 kilometers. So the Anita 3 experiment went up, it flew around the South Pole, it came out, and then what happened is about right here, now it looks like the balloon is drifting off to more in, to, 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 to increasingly northern latitudes. There was some concern that the balloon would drift off into the ocean. Once that happens, you cannot recover the data. So what the PI of this experiment decided to do was to um, send a signal you telemeter a signal up to the payload, and you basically just drop the payload at that point. So the payload lands, I'll show you a picture of the payload after it landed, to ensure that it does not go off over water. This was our experiment, uh, it's called the High Cow Experiment. It's a bad joke in English. Um, and this was an experiment called the Super Pressure Balloon Experiment. So, one of the uh, so one of, the, one of the things that NASA has experimented with in the last couple of years is a so-called superpressure balloon project. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. But in a standard balloon, um, so, a, so standard balloons are such as um, Anita and ours and the spider experiment are called variable volume, variable volume experiments. Variable volume balloon. And the idea is that you have um, some very, very thin mylar, which is the material that the balloon is formed from. And uh, of course, in PV equals NKT, as the sun goes up and down. So, another reason why Antarctica is a good place to do these experiments is because the sun. You know, the change in the solar elevation in the sky is not very large. It goes from about 10 degrees above the horizon to about 30 degrees above the horizon. So the solar heating on the balloon is not so big. 
as the temperature increases, so if the sun is higher in the sky, the temperature of the gas increases because the amount of flux is just going as cosine theta. Temperature increases, volume increases, volume increases, buoyancy goes up, and the balloon goes higher in the air. Now, if the volume increases, that means that the mylar, the stuff that your balloon is made out of, is stretching. So it's stretching and it's contracting. The sun goes down and it goes down again. And we can see this in our elevation models. You just see this pattern of the balloon going up and down in the sky. Now, that's good, although typical mylar uh, balloons have a limited lifetime. As an alternative, what you can do is you can make your balloon out of something which has a which will not stretch and maintain constant volume, and that's called a super pressure balloon. And the the SPB uh, is just an acronym for super pressure balloon. The to do that, the uh, the material has to be heavier than mylar. So. This is something which has not been done before, and you overpressure the balloon. The typical pressures inside the balloon are higher than for a variable volume balloon. The NASA first, now one advantage of this is that instead of having a flight which only lasts, for instance, like 35 days, which is the maximum that Mia has flown, you have, you can in principle have a flight that would go for something like 100 days or 120 days. The disadvantage is that you have a typically higher pressure inside the, um, inside the balloon itself. And in fact, this year, the balloon got this far and then it sprang a leak and it came down. Uh, so it's not clear whether or not they're going to, they're not going to continue this project. Okay, <coughs> this, is what, this is what the Anita payload looks like. Um, Here's uh, uh, my graduate student, Mark. Uh, this was taken, I guess, in December. And there's this array of these horn antennas. And uh, under here are the, um, the photovoltaic uh, solar panels, which are supplying uh, the 500 watts or so that's being consumed by this experiment. And all the electronics are in here, in that box. OK. Now, to launch these things, to launch these things, um, what you do is, uh, so this is the balloon as it's being inflated with helium, and there's this little truck, and once the balloon gets up into the air, the truck sort of directs it until it's just vertical, and then it releases the balloon. So this truck is intended to, once it gets up in the air, to direct the direction in which the balloon is going to go. You want to make sure that the payload does not scrape the ground. Okay, so this is what the this is what it looks like in, in various stages. This is on the ground. This is being slowly being this is you see it's being filled with helium now. And now the need is up in the air. And this is what it looks like um, not far from float. So at this at this point, it's high enough that the volume of the balloon is about the same as a large um, soccer stadium. So this would be as big as the Rose Bowl in America for your motion heat. And this is what it looks like. So this is what it looked like when it came down. Um, of course, it doesn't look as pretty, but the main thing is that all the electronics inside this uh, inside this box are um, are are preserved. Okay. Um, now, in in principle, the Anita experiment was designed to measure um, neutrinos. What was registered was instead of neutrinos, what was registered was ultra high energy cosmic rays. And there, you also get radio wave signals from the combination of two different effects. So, if you imagine a, an extensive air shower, so an extensive air shower develops in the upper atmosphere, 
And what happens is you get, here's your primary particle, and then you get charge. Let's just look at the electrons and positrons. Now, through the same process that I outlined before, as the electrons and positrons initiate a shower in the atmosphere, you get this so-called charge excess. So you're going to have exactly the same sort of coherent radio wave radiation in air that we had in ice. So the first thing that you get is this coherent radio mixture. Okay. In addition to that, there is a geomagnetic separation. So the magnetic field at the South Pole is mostly vertical, or let's see, has a sort of at an angle like this, let's say. So as the as electrons and positrons are coming down, there is a there's a QB cross B separation of the electrons and positrons. So the two charged species separate, and that leads to so-called geomagnetic radiation. And this radiation can be thought of as the Fourier transform of a creation of an electron. So these electrons are short-lived. There's an electron which is created here, and it lives till here. So here is creation. And here is uh, death or destruction. And the fact that there's a finite track length means that you can calculate an associated radiation electric field due to this effect. Since the electrons are separated from the positrons, you get this net so called geomagnetic electric field. Geomagnetic field. Sorry, ge uh, you have this geomagnetic um, radiation. Okay. And that radiation is observed mostly by reflection off of off the surface. That's how it goes. And in the first Anita experiment, surprisingly, there were 14 of these radio signals that were observed by reflection and two that were observed directly. And what's interesting, of course, is that the reflected signals, when they reflect off of the ice surface, they invert their, uh, their, their phase. So because of the fact that there's a reflection here, the polarity of these signals is opposite the polarity of the direct signals. And that was, in fact, that was in fact observed in the data. OK, now what? What we've been mostly concerned with is that the, um, the surface reflection. So what you want to do, what you want to do, here's your balloon. Here's your balloon. And here's your air shower. And what you see is the reflection of the radio signal off of the surface. Now, if the surface is flat, then you get reflection that looks like a mirror. However, we know that the Antarctic surface is not flat. We know that the Antarctic surface has so-called roughness to it. And here are some pictures that were taken at various points along the uh, at various points in the Antarctic um, along the continent that were taken by uh, the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute in Saint Petersburg. So every year, this group has a set of trucks that drive from the Antarctic coast, uh, Station Progress, to Station Vostok. And they just took these pictures along the way, and you can clearly see the variation of topography. Now, this sort of a topography will clearly distort the image that you see. If you're trying to reconstruct the energy of the initial cosmic ray, then if the reflection is off of this rough surface, the correction or the loss of coherence will be larger than
then offered a service like this. So what we were given the task of was to estimate what the effect of decoherence was due to this surface roughness effect. So what we did is a couple of things. The first thing that you can do is you can observe the sun. Here's the sun. You can observe the sun with this radio instrument both through its direct signal as well as through its surface reflected signal. And that's shown in these interferograms. So what I've done here is I've basically shown you the radio frequency image of the sun. And you see two images. Uh, this is the direct image of the sun. It's sitting about 20 degrees above the horizon. And this is the reflected image looking down into the, into the snow. This is in vertical polarization. This is in horizontal polarization. If you're familiar with optics, you know that the horizontal polarization will be larger because of the fact that the so-called Fresnel coefficients for horizontally polarized signal are larger than for vertically polarized. So if I imagine I have a, I have a signal, so I'm looking at the signal coming from the sun, I'll call this part, that, that polarization V-pole, and that, this part, H-pole. The H-pole reflection coefficient is always larger than the V-pole, and that's exactly what we see. So now what you can do is you can just take the ratio, it's a different question why the reflection is brighter than the direct solar signal. And that is only an artifact of the fact that the, the antennas themselves are actually pointed down away from the sun and towards the, uh, towards the surface. But you can correct for that effect and you can tabulate what the ratio is of the reflected signal to the direct signal as a function of the elevation, and you get a plot that looks like this. So these, these are the data points, and this is the curve that you would expect if the reflection was specular. So this is the curve, this car corresponds to so-called Fresnel coefficients, which is the simple-minded expectation for reflection off of a perfectly smooth surface, and in general, they agree pretty well, except as you get to low angles. As you get to low angles, then in this picture back here, you're looking basically right across the ridges instead of going into them. So you're actually seeing, you're seeing at very low elevation the effects of the ridges, and the effect is becoming bigger. Unfortunately, most of the cosmic rays are observed along those ridges. So the other thing that you can do is the following. You can say, well, let's suppose what I do is I'll launch a trailer balloon. So the big Anita balloon goes up, and then I wait a couple of hours, and I'll launch a second balloon that will basically just follow it and send out little radio pings. And what I'll do is I'll measure the radio pings in the Anita experiment. And that's what we, that's what we put together. The challenges of doing this are that we have a little, we have a little balloon, we have a total mass of five kilograms that we can carry on this balloon. The second thing is that we need a high voltage radio transmitter. And our, we have a budget of zero dollars. So how do you get a high power um, radio transmitter? with a budget of zero dollars. Well, what you do is you go to Walmart, uh, or what the, you don't have Walmart, you haven't poisoned with this yet. There's some equivalent that you have. You don't have, there's no equivalent. You live in paradise. What is it called? Except you don't know what it is. You have me Mega. Mega and Metro. Mega and Metro. Okay, European. It's an elegant Walmart. No, it's not a supermarket. This is. Yeah, I mean, this is um, what was that? What was that? Oh, Wally. 
Do you, do you see this movie Wally, the Pixar movie? Yeah. Okay, and they're all like cruising around, right, right, right. That was like the Walmart dystopian nightmare. So if you go to Walmart in America, this is so sad. You go to Walmart in America, um, you know in America we have all these health problems. You go to Walmart in America, and you know, these Walmarts are huge. They stretch over entire states almost. And you walk into a Walmart, and the first thing that happens is somebody offers you a little mechanical cart that you can climb into, so you don't have to expend energy walking up and down the aisles and getting things. You just get in your little golf cart, it's battery powered, and you just cruise around in your battery powered golf cart, just like those people in that movie in Wally. -E. Well, Walmart is good for something, and what it's good for is uh, you have this word barbecue. Same word in Russian, barbecue. Okay, so um, so you know these. Um, it's the same thing as cigarette lighters. So cigarette lighters work. Uh, they're based on these uh, these little piezos. So a piezo ceramic. You know you compress it. You compress the ceramic, and then you release the pressure and you get, it responds with a voltage pulse. It turns out that this voltage pulse is pretty big. So what we did is that we bought a $10 Walmart pulser, and then we attached it to a, and it, so instead of having my graduate student up in the balloon pressing a button, we have this little motor that turns and the motor just keeps pressing on this spring every three seconds. Ping, ping. And every time it presses on the spring, the spring pushes down on the piezo, and boom, you get a spark. There's a little problem with this spark, with this design, however, which is that, remember that these balloons are flying up at five millibars. They're at an elevation of almost 40 kilometers. And it turns, down, it turns out that the breakdown voltage in air goes down rapidly with elevation. So the first time we did this in the presence of uh, some mylar, which is the material of the balloon, the first time we did this, we put it in a, let me show you. Yeah, so we put it in this little vacuum chamber. It was unprotected and we pumped it down to pressure and it went ping, 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 and then all of a sudden we got a coronal discharge and suddenly we're burning mylar inside this, inside this little plate. So that's why we decided that we had to put it inside this little, um, this little pressure vessel. So this whole thing is sealed in and it contains, the, um, it contains this, uh, this antenna and it contains the little sparker, the little signal generator, and the whole thing is sealed. This is, if you ever want to buy one yourself, you can get them online for $13. Um, it's remarkable that NASA let us fly a $13 piece of instrumentation on one of their huge balloons, but of course we didn't tell them that at the time. Uh, and this is what the whole thing looks like. There are some associated electronics. Um, there's, we had to write, uh, there's, a, there's some timing electronics, etc. And in addition, there is a device, which actually, which is not on here, which allows us to determine the azimuthal orientation, the so-called high cas that I talked with Nina about. And this is what the whole thing looks like. It's very simple when it comes up in the air. Um, and again, it's painted white to avoid, um, avoid too much heating. So we stuck this thing up, up in the air, and then uh, you, can, you can send a signal up. You told them, or you, you can contact, you, talk, you can talk with it, essentially. You talk with this box through Iridium Communications. So you talk with the box through Iridium, and you say, OK, I'm going to start turning on the motor. And you hope that Anita starts registering signals. Um, I showed you this picture already. And of course, we're pretty happy when from a distance of 800 kilometers away, Anita could actually see our little $10 sparker that was sending signals out across, you know, a quarter of the Antarctic continent. So this is 
These, this is what the Anita record looks like. So each of these is about a 100, yeah, 110 nanosecond capture of data. We use these special uh, digitizers that are called, if you're familiar with them, they're called switch ca capacitor array, capacitor array digitizers. And these digitizers run at about uh, 2.8 giga samples per second. And the whole thing uh, was running at, so there's, as you can see, there are, I think there should be something like, um, well, six times eight. So 48 channels. Each channel corresponds to one of those big white horn antennas on the payload. And as so every second, we take about 50 triggers. The trigger rate is about 50 hertz. And this is what one of the, uh, the triggers was corresponding to our, um, to the HiCal antenna, or the HiCal transmitter. And in fact, we also saw signals. We saw signals from a little trailer balloon. to go back here. So, we saw both the direct signal as well as the surface reflected signal. And now it's just a matter of analyzing all the data. And from that, we can hopefully determine or deduce what the reflection coefficient is in this, in this regime. That's, that's the idea, at least. OK, so that's our little contribution to the science. All right. Um, now, the Anita mission, I uh, must be getting close, what time is it? Oh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. The Anita mission it will have one more flight in 2017, 2018. And <clears throat> after that, the question is, what's the next thing to do? The next thing to do is uh, so-called EVA. And the way that EVA works is pretty clever. So if you remember the picture, you have this huge balloon at float. You have this huge balloon, and underneath it, you have this little gondola. And this is what is detecting neutrinos for you. Instead, if you were clever, what you would do is you would turn this whole thing, the whole balloon, into an antenna. Instead of just having antennas here, why not make your entire huge balloon, your rose ball, Wujniki size stadium balloon, make that the antenna. And that's the idea of the EVA experiment. So you have, um, you have what's called a feed array, and the feed array just consists of a set of dipoles which run around the outside of the balloon itself. So you're literally going to put dipoles on the balloon itself, on the mylar, that feed array will focus signal into focal plane, and in that way you can boost your effective sensitivity by a factor of 100. It's quite a challenge. It's a big engineering challenge. And the budget will run probably about $25 million, and it hasn't been, it hasn't been, it hasn't been approved yet, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, for completeness, um, I'll mention that there are yeah. I'll mention that there are, um, so in addition to our experiment, which has antennas buried into the ice sheet, in addition to the Anita experiment, which uses antennas that are up in the air, there's also a so-called surface array, which is called Ariana, and Ariana consists of uh, antennas which are just very close to the, very close to the surface. They're just subsurface. So this sort of a scheme requires no drilling at all. It doesn't require that huge, elaborate drilling rig that I showed you before, and it has some, it has some advantages. It's on the Ross ice shelf, and it's in a place which is very, very far from any interference. Even at the South Pole where we are, there's still, I mean, you know, there's a one megawatt heating plant. There's a me me one megawatt station generator, so there's still a lot of radio interference. But uh, the Ariana concept um, is specifically at a place where there's no uh, radio interference. The problem with their location is that whereas we have almost three kilometers of ice, 
at the South Pole, they only have about 500 meters of ice. So they're assuming that they'll see neutrinos. So the amount of ice they have for neutrinos to inter interact with is only 500 meters thick instead of three kilometers thick. Their assumption is that they'll be able to see neutrinos interacting in this thin layer that are coming both from directly up going signals as well as signals that are coming through reflections and in that way they'll enhance their, their sensitivity. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Um, there's, I haven't really talked very much about, um, about actual experimental results and comparisons with theory. If we had another week or so, I would, but we don't have another week. Thanks very much for your patience and thanks for enduring my, my uh, yeah, thanks for enduring this and I hope it wasn't uh, too difficult. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. Спасибо.